Uh, my name is Dorothy Maples. I work for Nahama, Jewish Response to Disaster. The word Nahama is Hebrew for to bring comfort. Um, we deployed down to Louisiana, the Baton Rouge area. Four weeks ago tomorrow, I left Minneapolis driving our vehicle. Um, we've been in the field as this next Wednesday for three weeks in service. We've completed an estimated 40 homes, meaning they have been gutted and debris removed, so they're ready for the next step. Um, currently, we have about five field teams in the, in the different neighborhoods working on homes, doing the same thing. We've been partnering with AmeriCorps and Triple C to be able to get to more homes more quickly. And then we've been having about 20 to 25 residential volunteers stay with us, which means people have taken time out of their busy schedules to come down and stay from you know two nights to two weeks. Some have committed to up to a month to be down here to assist. So we've been just really focusing on volunteer outreach so that we can keep those numbers going and continue to be able to help the people that merge. We don't necessarily choose in the sense of just walking up. Um, there are different ways that we get the information from homeowners. Sometimes it's through local synagogues letting us know about people in their community that they know that were affected. Sometimes that's the, the first ones we start with because we've got a chunk ready to go before we're even on the ground. And then through us just being in neighborhoods like this and seeing our truck, people walk up. I mean, yesterday I was working on a home and had four homeowners walk up and just ask for assistance. So word of mouth is another way. And then there's also something called crisis cleanup which is, so sorry, the mat is right in my face. Um, <laughs> there's also crisis cleanup. It's a, a database, for lack of better terms, it's actually a database where people can call 211 and get put into the system so all of our national uh, voluntary organizations active in disasters can have access to that information and pull people's, home, uh, pull people's information from there so they can get out there in a the system. It actually helps us to be able to collaborate a little bit more effectively and get to more people more quickly. Still Snoop Dogg and D.I. Yes, who's there? The United Nations' eighth Sustainable Development Goal is decent work and economic growth. The UN wants to promote inclusive and sustained economic growth and ensure full and productive employment. Let us explain. Firstly, the UN wants to ensure at least a 7% growth in the economy in less developed countries per year. This means that every nation's net value in accordance to its overall production and services should be growing by at least 7% year on year. The UN also hopes to achieve high levels of economic productivity through diversification, technological upgrading and innovation. As well as that, the UN will strive to achieve a full and productive employment for all men and women and ensure that people with disabilities receive equal pay for work of equal value. Furthermore, by 2020, we hope to substantially reduce the proportion of youth not in employment, education or training. This can be done by promoting development-oriented policies that support decent job creations, entrepreneurship, creativity, innovation and encourage the formalization and growth of micro, small and medium-sized enterprises. <sighs> it's also highly important that we take effective measures to eradicate forced labor, slavery and human trafficking, including the recruitment and use of child soldiers. And that is what you should know about the United Nations 8th Sustainable Development. I think I'm falling for you. So what are you going to do about it? Check out members.worldmerit.org and thanks for watching.
When I work with children with disability, I saw that how vulnerable they are and how they have limitation for just walking in the street and getting quality education. For that reason, I know that they have some limitation. I have dreamed that by 2030, uh, in the Azerbaijan, all across the world, all people with disability will get the quality education and this job opportunity. They did. We actually discovered that there were about uh, five or six existing clearinghouses. And what we wanted to do was to build a, a citizen-centered uh, single stop, you know, for shopping, for volunteering. So we brought all the, uh, convened the leaders of these clearinghouses in to the White House, and we ended up creating um, uh, volunteer.gov. So you, Carrie, could go into that system, type in your zip code, Silver Spring, Maryland, and find a uh, wide array. You could type in your interest, you know, mentor or tutor a child, um, work to clean up a river or park, uh, work in disaster preparedness and response. And you could find literally dozens of opportunities right next door. Or if you wanted, you could say, I want to work on malaria control in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And you could go into that system and find um, nonprofit organizations that deploy Americans abroad, in that case to Rwanda, to work on malaria control. And the president's a, he's a results-oriented guy, and so every time I, bri I briefed him twice a week in the Oval Office, and he would ask me, you know, how are we doing? And I could tell him where we were on um, the number of Americans who were serving in the Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, VISTA, the Citizen Corps, the Medical Reserve Corps, all these federally supported programs. But he said, how are we doing on volunteering? And we discovered that the, the government didn't collect regular information on volunteering. So we put in place, and it still is uh, used every single year, the annual volunteering in the United States census report. Interesting. And so I can actually tell you, Carrie, that um, the year after 9-11, we expected volunteering to rise. But uh, volunteering went from 59.8 million Americans, which was about 25 or 6 percent of the population, up to about 29 to 30 percent of the population, which is actually a very significant increase. And Americans sustained this spirit of giving and volunteering uh, through about 2006. So five years after 9-11, the country was still had this outpouring of this volunteer spirit. And um, really, uh, it, it knit us together as a country across party, across religion, across race, across ethnicity. And frankly and sadly, I think about the times we're in now and how communities are ripping themselves apart over such things. And the election was even quite divisive. And I think we need to resurrect and bring back that spirit of we're all Americans and fundamental to being an American in our DNA since before our founding has been this spirit of uh, volunteering and service and uh, not relying on government, but relying on our institutions of civil society and faith-based institutions uh, to care for one another. The jobs and economy of the future will be urban. By 2030, 60% of the global population will live in cities. To ensure decent work and economic growth, local leaders face many challenges. 40 million jobs need to be created every year for young people entering the labour market. Depending on the developing region, between 45 and 90% of workers are in the informal economy. 
There are 168 million children in child labour worldwide. Women's average wages are between 4 to 36 percent less than men's. Many local governments are already taking action, fostering community participation and social dialogue between employers and workers, including in the informal economy, adapting and responding to economic trends and challenges, promoting entrepreneurship, job-oriented policies, innovation and labour protection, and learning from one another through city-to-city -city cooperation. Local and regional governments do all this to ensure inclusive and sustainable economic growth, employment and decent work for all. Which is Goal 8 of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. Achieving SDG 8 depends on local governments. When I was five years old, I was an annoying kid playing all the time and asking my mom to buy me that toy or that toy. And I always wonder why my dad can do the same. Why he needs to spend his time like doing boring things like waking up in the morning very early or coming back late at night. But you know, time has changed. From 2007 to 2012, the number of unemployed people has increased from 170 million to 202 million. And 75 million young people just like me are currently unemployed. So I guess that my father, he had an easier time finding a job. But we can change that. Hello, I'm Carrie Keenan. I'm joined in the studio by Mark Shriver, who recently completed a book about his dad, Sergeant Shriver. So it sounds like every time he met one, met a volunteer, yes. he was looking for ways to continue to expand and improve the program at all he times. Worked, he worked very closely with uh, his successors in the Peace Corps, whether they were Republicans or Democrats. Uh, and I think they relied heavily on dad's experience and his, uh, his energy. And yeah, Dad, when he met somebody, and my mother did it too at the Special Olympics, he, you know, people that were volunteering, how could we do a better job training you as a volunteer? Uh, how could we do a better job supporting you when you're either a Peace Corps volunteer or a Special Olympics volunteer? Uh, so they were constantly trying to do a better job. They were constantly trying to support people and encourage more people to get involved. What impressed you most about your dad's mission of service? Well, you know, uh, the thing that impressed me the most about Dad was, you know, he's a real human being. Uh, he, he was a good father, a, a really good father, and uh, did all of these wonderful things around the world. But he was in the moment. So if you were talking to him at a cocktail party, he didn't look over your shoulder. Uh, he didn't care about anybody else in the room but the person in front of him. And that's really hard to do, especially in a town like Washington. Uh, and you see that commitment uh, to the individual, to the moment, um, and his, his call for the Peace Corps and the creation of the Peace Corps and his movement to encourage people to volunteer. Uh, I think he really believed, you know, he went to Mass every day. And he believed that God exists in all of us. And I think he realized that this moment is a special moment. And, you know, you don't have tomorrow. You, don't have, you can't worry about what happened yesterday. And the best thing to do is to treat people as they're human beings that they are, as valuable gifts from God. And that that translated into volunteerism. Because you got to help people out because you're made by God. And that's a pretty powerful thing. I know that, you know, my father, um, uh, President Kennedy, reached across the aisle to try to get things done for this country. And I think um, Republicans and Democrats, uh, you know, they'd fight it out in elections. But once the election was over, I think there was much more of a sense of, okay, what can we compromise on uh, to help move the country forward? And today I feel that in politics, there's much more of a sense of, I've got to destroy you, whether you're a Democrat or Republican. And there's much more emphasis on what separates us. Democrat, Republican, gay, straight, you know, Catholic, Jew, um, you know, North, South. You're, uh, our political leaders seem to want to divide us in order to get to 50 plus one. And I think in those days, the folks cared more about how to move the country forward. Um, President Nixon and President Kennedy served together in Congress. They obviously ran against each other, uh, but my father was so proud of the work that he did with, um, you know, Mrs. Reagan, who uh, was an honorary chair of uh, uh, foster grandparents. Senator Hatch's work with Special Olympics. Governor Romney's dad, Governor Romney of Michigan, was the honorary chair of Job Corps. 
So he reached across the aisle. He didn't care whether you were a Catholic or a Protestant, or whether you were Jewish or a Republican, whether you were from the North or the South. I think there was this sense that we, there were things we could do together as a country if we looked at what we had in common and tried to move forward. I think that's really important. People, you learn that by volunteering. I don't care whether you're black or white, a guy or a gal, or whether you're Jewish or Catholic or a Republican or Democrat. You know, you got to pick up and clean out this child care center in New Jersey where, say, the children's been working. You got to help get them back on their feet. And if you work together, a lot of those misunderstandings get knocked and pushed away. So what are your thoughts on the future of volunteering? I think, you know, the uh, younger generation is very much engaged. Uh, I think they want to do more uh, for the community, both globally as well as locally uh, and all across the country. Uh, there's so many people that want to get engaged. I think we just got to give, continue to give them the opportunities and encourage them. I think we got to say you got to get off your butts. You got to stop looking at your, you know, iPhone and playing video games. Uh, I see, you know, that's the tension. People are so enamored with their um, electronics, mm -hmm. and it's not you're not getting up and moving. Mm -hmm. um, but I think once they're given those opportunities and encouraged, they're doing great work. I saw a lot of volunteers down in the Gulf Coast after Katrina and Rita. We saw a lot of volunteers, amazing stories up in uh, New Jersey, and New York, and Connecticut after uh, Hurricane Sandy. And we see it, Save the Children sees it in the Philippines and in Haiti. There's a lot of folks that want to volunteer. Uh, so I think the movement's alive. I think it's doing well. I think we've got to keep pushing. Uh, we can always do better. So it's a positive thing as long as we keep the positive force going. Absolutely. And I think this, you know, the show is important to get that message out that there really is a need for volunteers. And you're going to get more than you give. Um, you, you know, it takes time. It takes maybe some vacation days. Uh, but you're going to grow as a human being. You're going to make a connection with other human beings that is going to be really powerful in your life. Whether you're volunteering at Special Olympics or you're volunteering at Head Start or you're volunteering for Save the Children, doing our work, uh, responding to disasters, or any organization, Habitat for Humanity. They're such a powerful uh, experiences for you. Absolutely. And once you have those experiences, it's, it's been my observation that people who have those experiences want to share them with others and encourage others. So once yeah, they it's have exciting. That, and it just builds from it there. It builds, yes, know. absolutely. People, you know, they, it changes their lives. Mm -hmm. Get out and you volunteer. You make a difference in a kid's life or in a person who's had a tragedy in their life, they've lost their homes, they're never going to forget you. Mm -hmm. And that makes you feel like you're human, you're alive. You're helping somebody else instead of just worrying about your own skin. Right, and that makes you, that's a powerful experience. It is. So we've been focusing a lot on some of the domestic volunteer issues. Now, International Volunteer Day is coming up on December 6th. Let me rephrase that. International Volunteer Day is on December 6th. So what are your thoughts on the future of international volunteering? I think, you know, we've got to uh, put pressure on our elected officials in Washington. We have to send a message to your senators, to your congressmen, congresswomen, uh, your uh, mayors, the governors, that volunteerism is important, um, that it should be a stress not only in this country, but also there ought to be opportunities that are available for people to do volunteer work abroad. Um, most politicians don't lead. They listen and they follow. Uh, so if people get engaged, you make a phone call, you get 10 of your friends and you go meet with your congressman or your senator um, and you tell them that this is a really important issue, they're going to listen. I was in elected office for eight years. You know, When people came into my office, took the time to come in and visit and tell me about an issue, I knew it was important. Uh, most politicians, they'll respond to either votes, which are people coming in and telling them it's important, or money. So if you want to give money, you can give money. If you want to get engaged and mobilized around the issue of volunteers, and that'll make a big difference. Mm -hmm. They'll follow. Politicians will follow you if you get out and lead. That's a great point. So instead of the politicians leading, you're encouraging people to lead. Yeah, to you, make you know, it's, it's a democracy. You've got to get your voice heard. And most politicians don't lead. Because if they lead and they're not you know, feeling it right, people some don't want change. They vote them out. Well, Thank you so much. Thank you it's for having me. It's been a pleasure me. talking with you. Thanks a million. Right? Mark's book is A Good Man, and we really appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. This is Travel Television, Carrie Keenan. These aren't the faces of Democrats or Republicans. They're Americans. The AmeriCorps members who roll up their sleeves every day to alleviate poverty, improve struggling schools, and respond when disaster strikes. AmeriCorps is one of the most successful federal programs ever. Millions have served our country, and millions of private dollars help fund it. 
No wonder more than 80% of Americans support it. So tell Congress, expand, don't eliminate AmeriCorps. Let me take you into the town of Kazimierz, where in 1993, Steven Spielberg shot his film, Schindler's List. This film drew international attention, but the town of Kazimierz was established in the 14th century and was originally a royal city of the crown of the Polish kingdom. Today, it's located south of Krakow Old Town. many centuries, Kazimierz was a place of coexistence between Christian and Jewish cultures. Its northeastern part of the district was historically Jewish. But in 1941, the German occupying forces took those inhabitants and forcibly removed them and placed them in the Krakow ghetto. 17,000 of those residents from the Jewish quarter were eventually brought here to what became known as the Jewish ghetto. And Christoph was sharing some thoughts as to what took place here on the plaza. In fact, Christoph, you explained to me that at any given time, the Germans would bring out one to 2,000 of the residents here exactly. for the selection process. Yeah, the selection goes this way. So you can either be able to walk or not. And in here, they actually select the people. If you are not able to walk, you've been moved from here to the concentration camp. Which basically was a death sentence. Exactly, exactly. And this is why you have the chairs in here, because the people, they still have hope that maybe they survive. So this is why they want to take as many useful things as they could. And of course, they were not able to take all those things. But That's they would bring, they bring their chairs. Exactly. And this is why they leave them in here. And this is why the monument like this, to remind us about those people who die in here, who've been moved from here to die in a concentration camp. How many people out of the 17,000 that were put into the ghetto survived? I would say around 1,000, something like that. Not many, not great right. group, actually. So just terrible. Exactly. But also, in addition to the selection process here in the plaza, some horrific things took place before anybody got sent off to a particular extermination camp. Exactly. Some really, really terrifying things happened, especially with the kids. When you think about that, it's really, really terrifying. So for example, you know, the, the commandant from here called Amonget, he actually took the small kids. From a mother. From the mother, exactly, and threw it on the ground. Just crush it this way. So, so we're talking not, about a, an infant. Exactly. Taken an infant, and thrown. Taken, throw it away on the ground. And also, you know, with the a little bit older kids, they just take them all together, put them head to head, so they could only use one bullet to kill them all. They would just murder children so right basically, here. Basically, you know, it looks like a river full of blood. There were so many people killed in here. Now, it's one of the things that, you know, it's hard to fathom what took place here because today you look, it's an open plaza and you can't believe the horrors, but that's why we do this, to exactly. talk about these things. Exactly. And you had mentioned there's a pharmacist that was here and he was the only Christian in the ghetto. Yes. How, how did he manage to be here? He was really smart because he said, that the pharmacy is actually needed in a ghetto because if the epidemic happened, the walls of the ghetto will not protect the Nazis from the epidemic. This uh, is why they let him stay. So isn't that interesting? And so, this is why he could use his position to help those people in here. Right. Really famous person. And so we're going to take a walk over there and take some, take in what they what they left behind because it's an interesting little museum that yeah. talks about some yeah. of what he experienced. Exactly. All right, off we go. Yeah. So the edge of the ghetto has a few reminders of the wall that contained the Jews. And the wall itself was designed by the Germans to look like, what do you think? To look like tombstones of all things. Um, really unbelievable. And if you think the wall's not high enough to keep people in it, just take a look over here because it's more than high enough. In fact, it was impossible for them to escape. The only way out was a deportation which was basically 
a ticket to extermination at one of the camps. family who's been out in the cold. You're a bottle of clean water in the hands of a thirsty child. You're a sandbag pushing back the flood. You're a traveler, a team member, a builder, a giver. You're a forklift driving, chainsaw wielding hand that reaches out. You're a line in the woods that fires can't cross. You're a garden that feeds a community. You're not help is on the way. Your help is here. Join AmeriCorps and Triple C. Be the greater good. break up the rocks and I lift them from one place to another and help in whichever way I can and it's been great. It certainly beats going to a gym. This gives you a different kind of view of young people working and working together towards a common goal. I'm in uh, middle age uh, and uh, when you start thinking about what do you want to do, how do you want to live your life, I think this is certainly a productive way. I think in service there is no age. You're going to love it. I mean, you're going to love being with 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds. It's all good. We're here to help the families, but we help each other out. We would get the Jersey Shore back on track and people back on their homes if everybody my age gave one week once in their life. It would be good enough. building a house for Mr. David Lonergan. Um, his home was among the homes that was um, uh, not usable anymore after Hurricane Sandy. Um, so his house has been gutted and um, we repaired some of the framing and now we're basically putting in all new walls and painting everything for him, putting in new floors. It's been a great experience watching people come back into their homes.